latest meeting of the uh, Montpelier Development Review Board on November 5th, 2018. And uh, the first item. Can you use your mic, please? Thank you. Certainly. Sure, I'm going to call to order this meeting of the uh, Montpelier Development Review Board on November 5th, 2018. First item on the agenda will be the approval of tonight's agenda. Should we introduce ourselves first? We should. So starting on our right. Uh, Rob, Rob Goodwin. Deb Markowitz. Meredith Crandall, staff. Kevin O'Connell, board member. Ryan Kane. Tom Kester. Claire Rock. So the first item on the agenda for this evening will be a designation of the acting vice chair. So board members, that's us to act on, for us to act on. I'll move that we approve Kevin as the acting vice chair. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of uh, having me be the acting chair, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes. Thank you. Um, to bring us up to date as to where we are in this deliberation um, of the 100 State Street and... Uh, Excuse me, Kevin, if I could just interject for a moment. Under um, Vermont Law 24 VSA Section 4465B4, I'm bringing a petition um, by 10 or more persons for interested persons. Um, any combinations of voters hey, and real property owners. And I would like to uh, give that to you, the appropriate municipal panel. I have the petition, and we also have compiled our comments. Um, and I could speak to those now. I do have a copy to turn in. At this moment, we're still d dealing with uh, uh, administrative issues. Uh, I'd be happy to entertain that uh, when we've gotten through those. Thank you. I just need to do it before we get into the work of the committee under um, Vermont law. Uh, I need and to we're not there yet. The okay. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to ask Meredith to bring us up to date as to where we are at this point in the deliberations for 100 State Street. And uh, Meredith, please uh, take it away. Okay. For very general starting purposes, just a reminder to the board members, the public, the applicants, um, that this is a development review board hearing. Um, so the questions in front of us today are whether or not the three applications in front of us meet the zoning regulations. Um, this is not the place to discuss whether or not the parking garage should actually be built or the location of where it's going to be built. Um, those questions are for tomorrow, in front of city council, the bond vote. This is all about these specific applications and the zoning regulations. Um, so we have, as I think everybody here knows, three applications before us. We have, first off, um, the subdivision request. Um, the city's request to subdivide the parcel owned by Capital Plaza. At the last um, hearing, there were a number of supplemental materials supplied as of October 19th, uh, following the last hearing, sorry. Um, and then some additional internal items were added in. So the major issues to deal with today on that really are um, probably to just revisit some of the traffic issues because there's an updated traffic study um, and then um, really the, the the I think the biggest issue on that one still is just to make sure that conditions regarding the master agreement and the easements making sure that those all line up with what has to happen under the hotel site plan amendment and the parking garage because the easements are all recognized in the subdivision final plat. So that's going to be the big thing, is the final plat here matching with everything else so they can all be recorded appropriately. Um, and you all have my staff report, and that was posted publicly if people need it. Is that more in-depth than you're looking well, for? That, that, if you could just address why we have the board configuration that, they, that we have this evening. Oh, the sorry. Fact that the chair yes, I can do chair. that one. Sorry. And then, I, and then I would like to move to the approval of the previous uh, Sorry, Kevin. Uh, minutes. Not yes. a problem. We're, we're, Jumped ahead. Yeah. 
sorry, all. Um, so yes, so tonight, as you can see, we had to appoint a vice chair um, because the chair, normal chair, Daniel Richardson, um, and it's included in the application materials and was posted on the website, provided um, the department with a letter recusing himself from any further participation in the hearings on these applications um, due to the potential appearance of a conflict of interest. So a copy of that letter is included in um, the board members' application packets. It was posted on the website. Um, I can probably, I think I've got some extras here of the full packet that I'll put up there on the table in a minute. Um, and as the vice chair, Kate McCarthy, is also not present, we had to have the board members appoint a vice chair to act going forward on this matter. Okay. Sorry, Kevin. That, that's <laughs> perfectly okay. So mo moving along, I'd just like to address the uh, approval of the uh, the minutes of September 17th, which are still outstanding, and the minutes of October 15th. Um, those members present at the uh, September 17th meeting were Dan Richardson, Kate McCarthy, Ryan Kane, Robert Goodwin, and which means we do not have a quorum for passing those. That these will be deferred till the next meeting. Looking at the meetings minutes for October 15th, uh, those in attendance that evening were Dan Richardson, Thomas Kester, Ryan Kane, uh, Robert Goodwin, Claire Rock, and Meredith uh, staff, of course. So let's say one, two, three. And in addition, I uh, watched the whole video so I can count for yep. approval of minutes. Okay, that all three hours. Very good. So we can <laughs> we can uh, we can act on the October fifteenth uh, minutes. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay. Second is so. Okay, we have a we have a motion to approve and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing that there is none, all those in favor, please. Uh, all those in favor and eligible to vote, please raise your right hand. And so the minutes for the October 15th are passed. Okay. Okay, now, um, just moving into the agenda itself, um, the agenda items itself, if I could ask you, yeah. Meredith, to bring us up to date on the three applications for 100 yes. states. Uh, the first being the subdivision application, the second being the, um, um, the removal of parking site plan uh, amendment, and the last one being the site plan review for the new parking garage. Okay. So you're good with what I said already with the subdivision, yes. or should I start over? <laughs> okay, so, so that's the, that was the subdivision. Um, so then, of course, we also have the hotel site plan amendment, Sorry, give me just a second. Um, so, for this one, again, we had some additional. Hold on one second. There were some clarifying items provided. If you look on your, it's a C4 stamped with October 25th, the big issue we had to clear up was whether or not the hotel site plan amendment um, proposed improvement site plan clearly had on it the um, frontage along the access easement to clarify that that was on this site plan as well as the garage site plan and the subdivision plat. Um, so that material has been provided um, for consistency and then there's the, the big issue we're going to have to watch out for here is to make sure that changes involved with the garage site plan get reflected in the final site plan amendment for the hotel. Because there may be some other things coming up that you decide on that have been discussed, including in today's design review committee hearing. Um, that may need to be reflected on the either the hotel site plan or the hotel landscaping plan 
because those are separate from the garage site plan. This is keeping those things separate, but the fact that they all interact. Um, and then that was the big outstanding issue for the hotel, was just making sure things were consistent. Everything else appeared to have been dealt with. Um, so then we get to the garage site plan. Um, I think that a lot of the issues on that one had been dealt with previously. Um, if everything new in your packet starts at the blue tab, um, new or presented during the last hearing, And some of the things in here, just so you know, in your packet are things that were presented by the public. They aren't necessarily views that the applicant believes represent what this project is going to look like. So just, you know, if you see something that looks odd, maybe flip back a couple pages to make sure you know what the context is. Um, for things in here that need to be dealt with, um, I need to update you on the design review committee outcome from this evening when you're ready for that. Okay. I'll be happy to do it. Right. Um, and then there were several items that I think probably Mr. Rabideau will be more able to incorporate in his presentation considering the amount of time we've taken up already okay. here. So, so at, this, at this juncture, uh, there was a considerable amount of public testimony and, and uh, applicant testimony taken at the October 15th hearing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Just don't forget your microphone. I don't know how oh, close you have yes. to be. You're right. Um, so uh, what we want to do this evening is pick up where that left off with the new information from the Design Review Committee. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to, board members, I'm going to be relying on you considerably. I was not at that meeting. Uh, I've reviewed the I've reviewed the transcript uh, uh, as much as I could, um, so I have a general view. But uh, we're going to really have to approach this as a as a board this evening. Um, and I do want to mention to the uh, those that are here this evening from the public, uh, the board uh, the board's uh, responsibility is to address the three applications that we have before us. I want to be very clear about that. Very specific. Uh, uh, items, uh, ha one having to do with subdivision uh, of, of property, the other having to do with a site plan amendment, which is the parking uh, issue, and uh, the final is the uh, uh, parking garage itself, and that is for site plan review. Any of the uh, more esoteric items are really not our pur within our purview, and the, uh, uh, as, as the zoning administrator has already mentioned, uh, the, uh, the the body uh, to address your concerns uh, in that area would be the city council itself. So, without uh, uh, belaboring the point too terribly much. Um, but these are all um, questions, yes. uh, concerns. For okay. The just as a general, just as a general rule, could you please wait to be called? You could ask to be to be recognized, and then uh, just just so we have a. Uh, a certain amount of decorum as we proceed. So uh, I will ask of anybody who has testimony this evening to please be on, on task with regards to the, the items that are before us. Uh, I'm happy to, to entertain um, uh, a little off script, but uh, I, I would like to, to see that uh, at, at, uh, uh, without being overly long or, or laborious, and uh, I'll be happy to to, to be timekeeper in instances like that. So is there anybody who would like to make a statement before we begin? Well, point, point of order, Mr. Chairman. I just wonder if I could yeah. move to uh, approve the agenda with the inclusion of that there was an election for an acting vice chair at this meeting as well. Certainly. Is that a motion? Yes, move, so move. Okay. A second? Seconded. Any discussion before we vote on the amendment to the uh, agenda? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And, uh, motion passes. Okay, now, board, do you have anything further before I ask for initial statements from from the public? Swear, 
Okay. And uh, we will be swearing in anybody who would be testifying this evening. Is Can I get a show of hands of who would like to testify this evening? Is testifying this evening? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to swear you in right now in mass. So anybody who would like to testify, please raise your right hand. Do you attest that the information you are going to give before this body is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so opening to for initial comments from the public. Who would like to be recognized? Yes. Yeah. Could you come forth to the microphone? Petition under 24 BSA section 4465B4. Um, this is for the Development Review Board, and it's in regards to applications um, Z 2018-0115 and Z 2018-0116 and Z 2018-0117. So. Um, have that, which I will give to you, and then we have summarized our concerns for the Development Review Board. Um, would it be appropriate for me to go through them quickly? There is probably would just take a few minutes. We've also um, printed them out in a copy that we will be submitting to the board for the record. Well, if you could uh, limit your comments to I would you know two or three minutes, two that would be minutes. that would be fine. Okay, and, great. And, and can you tell me again who who you are representing? Um, it's a group of residents um, and property owners of Montpelier. We have um, I guess eighteen people who have signed our petition. Okay, no. Um, so we do have um, ten concerns about these three applications. Um, the first being the need for 30 feet of street frontage. We're citing the uh, 3002.F uh, street frontage laws and the 3505B uh, lot dimensions. Um, all private or public streets um, or right-of-ways um, are going to have to go through the PUD process, and we do not believe that this one has done. Um, we also believe that there are inadequate analysis of the view corridors, and we're citing 2201D on that, and also um, the architectural standards 3207C, um, as well as the standards in 3507B. Um, and we also feel that the design review committee has not given um, analysis of these vistas. Um, and also, um, we've asked the city to fly balloons to confirm the roof heights, and that um, has not been approved. Um, in regards to the riparian uh, setback, the riverfront standards, 2101F, um, and the uh, urban center one-dimensional standards um, in section 3005. So, would it, would it be safe to say that you have a number of concerns where you're going to be citing the, the uh, legislation? Yes, I guess so, yes. Okay, and we'd be happy to take that as... Uh, Should I just limit my comments here just to well, our to, concerns and not the stating the I, that, that I think would Let be... Let me do that. Be I think that would be more... So useful. we just think it's an incomplete analysis um, of the setbacks and the uh, riparian setbacks and... Um, the river corridor analysis was not done. And we present a future phase of, uh, we presented with the future phase of canopy with solar panels, and that's a significant and material change, and that would necessitate a complete reopening of the hearings. Um, it materially affects the substantive, the substantive analysis under the review criteria. Um, and we feel that the board is obligated to undertake a comprehensive and cumulative review of those solar panel additions. Um, moving on to our concern five, the state stormwater permit and requirements should be part of the application. 
um, but we could not find the permit at this time. Um, our next concern is pedestrian safety and street design. I won't cite the sections that we're referring to. Um, and also the pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Um, we're very concerned about the safety. Um, and then our next concern is about the traffic studies and um, how many trips there are projected to be, and we're concerned that the conclusions of the traffic study didn't think that there would be an increase in traffic where we feel that there would be. Um, also, when you come in from the bank entrance to the proposed garage, the parking um, should be parallel and not perpendicular. Um, we are required to have five foot minimum sidewalks on both sides <coughs> of the street. Um, whereas there is only one side with sidewalks. Bike lanes should be present, <coughs> and the four-way intersection at the garage um, must meet at one point or be offset a minimum of 150 feet. The raised bike path and long alleys to the west of the parking garage both create unsafe pedestrian paths, so we're concerned about that. Um, moving on to our concerns about the loading zones. I know that due to testimony given, um, the original site approval for the hotel and smaller garage did have four loading zone spaces, but those were removed. Um, we feel that this would violate laws because it would slow traffic coming and going from the garage. Um, the, uh, the traffic study also has no analysis of when the peak flow is, um, and many of the conclusions, especially in the revised traffic study, um, are false conclusions based on no additional uh, data collected. Um, okay, I, I did want to uh, limit the comments yes, to just a few minutes. we're almost done. Um, uh, we, we were asking also that the police and fire comment on the extended scope of the project. Um, that hasn't been done. And finally, um, concerns about the wayfinding requirements that were not properly addressed in the meeting just prior to this that was concerned. Some of the board members were quite concerned that those have never been um, pictured, you know, drawn out. We don't know what it would look like. We don't know if those requirements would be met. So that's kind of a summary. And I have the petition and our um, discussion of the things. Okay, that thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. before we just uh, I think that can I suggest that we maybe have the applicant present the kind of additional information that was provided like the we, we haven't heard from the applicant about the updated traffic study and some of these other changes and I think it might be I mean helpful. we needed to have the petition we did in. Sure. right but, yeah. and so at this point let let's as you suggest Ryan okay. um, let's proceed in that way please come to the table <laughs> Mm. Going to speak. So we're looking for an update of uh, from what's happened since October 15th. That's understood. Testimony. Plus, uh, you presumably were at the design review committee. Yes. Uh, and so we're going to need uh, to integrate that into our discussion this evening. Of course. Yeah. Um, when we do that, it might make sense for me to say read off what they actually decided. And then maybe you can ask them ask them questions on that. Does that make sense? Just that, so that we have it clear, because I have that, it in front that, of me. That does make sense. Okay. Awesome. I'm just quickly going to try to get this working. <laughs> and and again, just just for the record and for the public, can you all identify yourselves for the? Of course. Uh, good evening. Thank you for your time. My name is Greg Rabido from Rabido Architects, and uh, with me this evening on my left is uh, David Grover from Resource Systems Group, our traffic consultant, and uh, James Finley Shearis on my right here is our landscape architect from Wagner Hodgson, and far left is uh, is uh, David Marshall from Civil Engineering Associates of South Burlington as well. I almost wanted to say Shelburne. Um, also with us tonight in the audience and who may speak is uh, Ron Lyon from Dubois and King who was a civil engineer for the original hotel project and continues to act in that capacity. Um, 
before I jump into my formal presentation, I just wanted, before I forget, to ask if we could get a copy of the, the notes that were presented to you before the hearing. Um, um, yeah, uh, is Mike here? Mike, can you go make a copy of this? And um, that, that's just so that I can try to react to some of what I'm hearing of tonight. And um, also uh, would ask that, you know, for, the, for technical matters, uh, it's, it's just sort of our opinion that um, if, if someone's going to make determinative, determinative or definite statements about uh, sort of traffic engineering or civil engineering or one of those issues, uh, we'd like to know the basis for those conclusions as far as the qualifications of the people making them. Well, as you know, uh, an individual who attends one of these meetings is can testify to anything that they wish, regardless of what. Uh, I understand, but if it if it if it if it reaches into the area of expertise, we'd like to un know the under under. I think that, that anything that's submitted to this board uh, is is a public document. Okay. So, for better or for worse, okay. you would see it anyways. All right. Enough said on that. Um, so, uh, I have a great many documents here, and uh, do you want me to turn off the lights up here? Because is the stuff you're presenting up here more new than compared to what's in their packets? Well, um, they got everything that you got um, that you provided to DRC. Yeah, I think most of the things that I want to show are are here, and um, they're going to speak to these subdivision issues. So I think it would be helpful. Okay. I, I, well, what I'm going to recommend is that we start with the subdivision part of it um, and then look at the uh, the amendment to the uh, hotel plan because those are two fairly simple things uh, because I, I'm, I'm going to guess that the bulk of our time will be spent on the site plan approval for tonight. Um, but here again, uh, you know, what we've got, what I'm putting up are the, uh, the essential elements of the application. We don't need to dwell on any of these for particularly long, other than to highlight a couple of things. Um, first of which, this is the uh, this is the subdivision plan itself, and and what's changed since our last hearing is the addition of all these various and sundry types of easements that are scheduled on the drawing. So there's the uh, utility easements. There's the uh, easement that allows this uh, sort of private road to cut through the project site, and and then there are you know various cross easements for purposes of utilities and the like. Um, since the issue is a lively one, uh, um, we'll be talking, uh, I think, primarily during site plan approval about any uh, any required setbacks from the from the north branch of the Winooski River, which is the only portion of the Winooski River that actually physically abuts the project site. Uh, otherwise, there's an intervening railroad land uh, right away on the one Taylor Street property. Um, does anybody have questions or, or, or lingering issues from the last hearing about the easements as they're displayed on this element? Because I think I think I think there was just a requirement that this be shown. Uh, but if anybody wants to question any one of them, um, we can talk about that. And board members that were here at the October 15th, I. I, I uh, would like to address those uh, concerns specifically to, to your recollection. Yeah, I just have one question. So the distance um, of the right of way um, where it intersects the entrance to the garage, the fr basically the frontage on that on that easement. Right. Here. Um, that's not. I mean, that's not 24 feet. That's oh. correct. It, it, I'm sorry, Dave Marshall, Civil Engineering Associates. Uh, that expands to 36 feet at the face okay. of the garage at the lot. I'm going to try to. I was wondering if the final plot could be updated to show the full dimensions of that of that easement. It seems like it would be a, maybe appropriate just in case there's a discussion about um, that width. That's fair. There. <laughs> Sorry. So he's talking about this area right here. And, and there are, as you can see, there are a number of easements that go through that area. <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're saying that's what what distance? Thirty six. That is correct. I just wanted to, to to just to clarify, there would be no easement that would cross the Heaney property from the parking garage to State Street. 
No, because the city controls both sides of that line. I, I don't, I don't know that we're subdividing the Haney lot. No. So at this point, there is a secondary egress from the garage. That's as you look at this particular plan, and it doesn't show the garage, but nonetheless, in the northeast corner of the proposed garage, um, there is an access that goes directly out onto the Heaney lot. And because the city does control that particular property, there is no proposed access easement because they control that, that access and egress component today. And of course, the easements on the hotel property we've discussed before. And is it, does it still stand that, that, that the idea of um, with the design of the garage is that would really only be used in case of an emergency? For the secondary egress the secondary. onto the, yes. Um, and then I will talk about that a little bit more under site plan and review, I, I presume. Was there anything further from the design review with regards to nope. this part? Nope. Nothing with regard to the subdivision. Okay. And so, board members, do you have any recollection of outstanding issues from October 15th? My, my notes say that it was essentially uh, information. <laughs> That is in, it's it's sufficient. It was complete. My review. There was. Some, I mean, I think you were going to clarify that that uh, these potential steep slopes, kind of between the right along this line lot. here. Well, yeah, exactly. Proposed right lot two and the the Hemi lot there, and those were confirmed to be less than thirty percent. That's correct. The, the information we provided to staff. And as part of the application, did indicate that that's the case. Okay. So if, if the if the board is, is uh, satisfied, and I'll put that question to uh, anybody here who is specifically interested in the subdivision aspect of this uh, project, as it's a, it's, a, it's a separate application. But I do believe that probably most of your concerns are on the site plan itself. So, unless there's, yes. I'm sorry, uh, Dave Marshall again. Yes. Um, uh, one thing that uh, I do want to uh, give credit to, the Department of Public Works provided uh, a report to staff with regard to right. issues on the project. And uh, it did try to create a roadmap, no pun intended, for uh, components that are important or integral to the uh, subdivision plan itself, as far as easements that are necessary to support. Uh, the other components of the project, specifically whether it be the hotel and the utilities that serve the hotel or the utilities that are necessary to serve the garage. Uh, and in this particular case, the, um, the report from Public Works basically I think represents a good document that would be an appropriate condition of approval that the applicant feed or uh, basically put into place um, those particular requirements or recommendations set forth in that document. And I do see that the uh, Director of Public Works is here. Uh, and Tom, uh, would, is, would you like to uh, comment? I'm sorry, I apologize. I took Tom's thunder out from under him. There. <laughs> There's plenty of thunder to go around. All right. <laughs> uh, Tom McArdle, Public Works Director. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dave. That's um, what our staff report is, um, was presented uh, as a recommendation. That's what it was intended for, um, that the board would accept. Um, those recommendations. The easement plan um, um, has, I think, everything that, that we believe is necessary, unless they've added it since, with the exception of the undesigned um, district heat line. That uh, I don't know that we have that uh, for uh, certain alignment of that, but I believe it will come from State Street. So, yeah. everything else I believe is complete. Um, this. This document will be uh, referenced in the, um, in the both the subdivision uh, conveyance as well as the um, agreements between the parties, um, removing all the other clutter. So it's, it simply speaks to the easements and the subdivisions that are necessary to complete the project. Okay, thank you. So, if there's no further discussion on the subdivision. Um, 
application itself. We'll move on to the uh, site plan modification for parking. I, I don't think there's a lot of new data submitted with this uh, as as far as it goes, I, I think the, the purpose of this second permit is to just allow for the use of off-site parking at the hotel uh, with the understanding that the off-site parking would be provided in this parking garage. Um, I don't know if, if it is. I mean, as I understand it, it's essentially you're going to abolish 160, 160 parking spaces, but those 160 would, would be recreated, essentially, yes. in... in uh, the parking garage should that project go forward so for purposes of what, what we need the board to act on is we need them to am amend the original approved hotel site plan to allow for this shift of parking from on-site to off-site and um, i don't i don't think that was a big issue last time there's no we don't have any new displays or anything on that um, no further action on the part of design review unless you think tra it's somehow involves traffic or anything like that but but um but just just as far as allowing the off-street off -street parking uh, um, i mean i think the uh the 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 arena for that is this is the site plan site right plan. there but it, but i did want to just sort of make sure that there's there aren't any other loose issues attendant on that um we will talk about internal circulation and clearly the subdivided lot and the and the garage will will continue to use the same circulation. We do have plans about stop signs and stuff. So when we get the site plan, we can talk about that. Were, were there any uh, decisions made at the planning committee? The design review. Design review that are relevant to this. Um, so the only thing at design review changes were discussed that wouldn't necessarily impact the site plan for the hotel but would impact the landscaping plan so there may be some changes to the landscaping directly in front of the sort of walkway between the garage and the hotel right down so here. there may be one tree there or small medium shrub that needs to be removed and some different landscaping put in that's the only change from design review that would roll over um, the only other thing we have to make sure is that as Greg was saying, that when we're looking at the parking garage site plan, that the when we, we have to make sure that a condition on the hotel site plan is to incorporate things like crosswalks, stop signs, things like that, that are technically on the hotel property, those have to be, in the end, put in the final approved hotel amended site plan that comes to the Department of Planning for, for the file. But other than that, there were no other changes to the site okay. plan. So I guess maybe a walkthrough of, of some of that, because I, I think that's a good point by Meredith, that part of the site plan amendment for the hotel site plan is kind of everything on the hotel's land. Right. A lot of the uh, sort of traffic flow and some of the signage is is part of that, that site plan. Okay. So I don't know if you can walk us through that quickly. Sure. And, of course, going back to that first drawing, which I won't drag back up, but... Um, Obviously, the easements that serve as access to this is one part of that, and, and those easements will become a permanent part of the permitted set for the hotel. Uh, at the request of, uh, of this and other boards, we were asked to uh, put together a plan for the traffic control signage, which is presented here. Uh, obviously, uh, these stop signs and, and other directional indications and things are part of the shared functioning of of these two lots together. Uh, in particular, there's a, a, a sign that will suggest that people exiting the garage who want to go to two, up to the interstate go via Taylor Street. You know, that's obviously us sending traffic a particular way through this lot. Um, so, so largely in terms of the uh, in, in terms of these shared traffic amenities, the landscaping uh, issue specifically was. Um, that the, develop, the, the design advisory uh, committee was looking for clear pathways from State Street to the river and the bike path. And uh, there are two. There's, there's one that goes from State Street along through here through a series of crosswalks between the garage and the hotel and down to the bike path that way. There's also pavement markings on the proposed for the Heaney lot 
that would extend the bike path back this way. Uh, from this point, you'd have to take a, this ramp feature up to the level of the uh, boardwalk, and there you can get on the bike path there. And indicated on the landscape site plan, we, we had put some wayfinding uh, indicators. And um, I'm trying to get to the site plan. Sorry, just let me get to the landscape site plan. Um, we had indicated a system of signage and benches, uh, which uh, was determined to be, I'm trying to get to that last image here, sorry, there. So we had prepared a plan, oh boy, stop, <laughs> one more, um, showing these wayfinding elements here, here, at the beginning of the ramp up to the bike path and then just around the corner here on the boardwalk here. So uh, that was fine, but it was not fully what they were looking for. What they were hoping for is a better visual cues to somebody coming from State Street that this is all going on. So in addition to the wayfinding stuff, which will remain a part of the project, we've been asked to relocate some trees in, the, in this area in particular that were blocking visual access to this element and then to incorporate into the final plans when we come in for a building permit addition, any additional features that would strengthen the visual connection and provide for better wayfinding for pedestrians which could take the, the form of uh, some artwork or colored pavement or, or other things. Um, we're amenable to that. We agreed to it at the, at the DA uh, Design Advisory and um, uh, so we're, we're hoping that can turn into a permit condition um, because we just learned about it at five, so uh, we don't we don't have a solution to that. But um, those wayfinding elements were for us based in part on the current plans being developed by the city of Montpelier for wayfinding citywide. Unfortunately, we didn't realize that the, the, that their particular proposal hasn't yet not yet been accepted. But what we want to stipulate is once the city settles on a program that, that it would be appropriate for this portion of this problem that, that our designs would be consistent with the citywide standards. And uh, we've just modified them slightly to incorporate some built-in seating where they happen. Um, so we did have an answer to that. Uh, the design advisory had some strong recommendations to enhance and improve that and we agreed to their suggestions. Uh, as, as to the, the number of uh, uh, parking spaces on the surface lot, I think yes. there's been a question as to if it's 55, 54. I was wondering if you could uh, provide a number. I did a manual count and came up with 55 surface parking spaces. And that will be consistent throughout uh, design? At, 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 this, at this point, anybody who hasn't fixed it on their plans is fired. <laughs> I, no, I don't know. I, I, I believe so, yeah. Um, the other design advisory issue uh, had to do with the type of railing proposed, and you, you sort of saw me scroll by some pictures here. Uh, this, this is a picture of the type of railing. This is a different project. This is up at UVM, I understand. Um, but this is the same fencing system being used at 1 Taylor Street, and we propose to use it here as well so that they're consistent one to the other. Design advisory was fine with that, but they added a a condition or a proviso that um, where this is in the landscape it will be uh, just regular galvanized and when it becomes part of the building design it'll be uh, uh, pot powder coated black um, and we were fine with that 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 works fine because we use this going up the uh, the, the accessibility slash bicycle ramp it's also used at the top of the retaining walls and we're using it as a way of keeping people from filtering into the garage from from unsecured points. We're trying to focus access to the garage to places where we have cameras and some control over the situation. So there are there are there are grates like this on the ground floor that sort of fill the openings. Anything else board? Um, Anything else in the hotel specifically? 
anything from the public on the hotel? Is there any further comment from anybody on this, on the hotel aspect? On the which part, which part are you? Hotel site plan amendment. Before Hotel we dig back. further for into the, for the parking, garage. at this point we we would be going into the main event, which is the site plan um, review for the parking garage. So we'll move along. Okay, thank you. Um, in in terms of site plan approval uh, for the garage, um, there are several pieces parts that we should talk about, and I'm going to invite first uh, David Grover to talk about traffic and and uh, issues related to traffic um, because there's been a change since the last version of the report presented to you uh, and uh, that's coming from our coordination with public works and and in responding to questions that have come up at the hearing so um, I want to invite David Grover to say a few words about traffic hey, David and just again for my for my knowledge as well as as the record could you state which which firm you are with and what your involvement in the project is sure <clears throat> david grover i'm with rsg also known as resource systems group and i'm the traffic engineer on the project and um the last meeting my colleague corey mack filled in for me due to illness so you heard from him that's why i look different than corey but uh we're going to hopefully say the same things surprisingly not that different. yeah <laughs> all engineers look the same um, so at the last meeting it was requested that we do new counts we've been relying on 2013 counts for the original memo and so right after that meeting uh, on October 18th we did a.m. and p.m. counts between uh, we looked at 7 to 9 in the morning and then 4 to 6 at night and then took the peak hour within those counts and update our traffic study to reflect those counts. And as we thought, the counts that we got um, on October 18th, 2018, were a bit lower than the counts that were done on 2013 that we had previously used. And this is consistent with what Dubois and King found. Um, and what we were also finding was that traffic has gone down since 2013. So has anybody ventured a guess as to why that's happening or what what affects that traffic is generally dropping in a lot of places uh, it's also going up in some places but in, in these urban type areas where we are seeing less traffic just around the state you wouldn't know that to look at some of the trans guidance they always wanted to be careful to make sure that we are looking at growing traffic um, we are finding a number of areas in around the state where traffic does go down particularly urban areas but specifically this one, I cannot venture a guess as to why. Okay. <clears throat> and so um, using these new counts, traffic had gone down a little bit, and our conclusions are still generally the same from what we counted uh, on our previous memo. The major change um, was that looking at level of service, um, major approach that is of concern is Taylor Street northbound on the um, Taylor State Street intersection and this was an F before the project we projected to be an F as well after the project there's some delay added there and then there's also the um, Governor Davis Avenue the southbound approach it went from a D and a PM to an E so it dropped one letter grade which sounds bad but also considered that it only went down by four seconds. <laughs> so it's four additional seconds of delay that happens to straddle the cutoff between a D and an E for level of service. And so that's that changed uh, from our last study. We were also asked to look at warrants for turn lanes. So we looked at uh, warrants um, at the driveways, both the State Street driveway and the Taylor Street driveway. We found that um, a Warrants are not met in all right and left turn warrants except for the left turn warrant at um, State Street. And so that's if you're heading west on State Street, about to turn into the site, make a left into the site. The warrant was met. And so it's, and that, I just want to give some context to that. It's met by about 30 cars, so it's just barely met. 
And we also should keep in mind that the warrants that we use and that all traffic engineers use in situation are really geared towards higher speed roadways, somewhat urban or so suburban areas, rural roads, where you don't expect to see a stopped car. The main goal of a left turn warrant is to, um, the, the, the danger in that situation is I'm driving along, someone is stopped in front of me to make a left, I don't expect them to see them there, and so I rear end them. And so we have these, we look at the volume, traffic volume to say, is this a danger we need to be worried about? And in this case, um, by the standards of a rural roadway, you might not expect to see somebody here. This is an urban setting. The people are stopping for pedestrians frequently. It's also a pretty narrow road, so people are pretty aware. And typically, we have found that it's not advisable to add a left turn lane to take up that pavement. Um, that's better. <laughs> to take up that pavement width uh, for a left turn lane when it's not going to enhance the safety greatly. And there's also concerns that if you have a stopped vehicle, it can prevent through traffic from going through, so we'll create delays. But we found that delays are, are minimal um, for through traffic. It's very infrequent that a left turning vehicle is going to stop a through movement for any amount of time. So the warrant, or sorry, the left turn lane would not be useful in that situation either. And so um, we were asked to do the left turn, well, these warrants, we did them. It is met in this one situation, but typically we would not recommend it actually be implemented. But as a condition of the permit, though, uh, it follow up studies that would look at whether or not mitigation might be warranted in the future. Yep. Is that something that, that could be looked at? Sure. Yeah, this, you know, if, if rear end crashes go up at the driveway, that would be indicative that I'm wrong and it is a danger. Uh, I also, if the volumes go up considerably, so it's, you know, well over the line and being met, that might be something that we want to talk to Public Works about too to see if it. Um, would be useful. And, it, and the way that it's designed, it, it could accommodate a left-hand turn lane? With the current um, width of uh, curb to curb width, there is enough room for a left turn lane. And there might be parking that have to be removed to accommodate that. Okay. And uh, with regards to, this was not information we had, had at the October 15th. This is all new. This is all new. And, and to summarize, how would you summarize it so we could? Uh... Uh, to summarize it, not much has changed <laughs> from my conclusion. It's, I still think that it's, it's a safe situation. There is um, level service Fs. They were there before the October 15th meeting. They're still there now. And in my opinion, the fact that the warrant was met doesn't necessitate the need for a left turn lane. So I don't think that changes anything either. Do you think that warrant would be met without the project site? I mean, we're, ta we're talking into right. the bank, that left turn lane from State Street into the bank, what's the bank access now? Yep. Given the, tr the back. Like so the I did I did that warrant as well. Yeah. Um, it's right on the line. Okay. So it's just under the line. It's just barely not met now, and it's just barely met with the site additional on traffic. OK, thanks. And I think one of the other things that we didn't have was looking at level of service, like leaving the this new uh, uh, private but public road. Right. And and I just kind of looked at it myself, but um, those were all fine as far as delays entering onto State Street from the project or entering onto Taylor Street from the project. Yep. Yeah, that's all um, A's, B's, and C's, D's. And it just, I should point out letter grades. Uh, we don't want our kids getting D's in school. But from a traffic engineering point of view, a D is fine. It's, it's delay, but it's not um, absurd delay. It's not uh, you know, road rage inducing delay. We have, we have low standards for road rage. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we do. Yep. If, if everyone's comfortable with traffic, I, I want to uh, pull in uh, Dave Marshall. And I know that there's a lot of concern about the uh, storm system. I should explain to you that there are um, storm improvements called for on the hotel plan. And then those are routed to storm improvements on what will become the city parking garage lot and the Haney lot to its ultimate discharge. So, so could I ask, how are those two 
issues being uh, they, they must be integrated at this point there are there are shared easements between the properties allowing for these for this plumbing to happen um, this this was actually part of the previous approval as well and it does tie into the bike path project um, but what I want to say is that for purposes of tonight's review there are really no proposed changes to the approved stormwater plan city approved stormwater plan for the hotel part of this um, obviously all of the uh, all of the work associated with the garage lot and the Haney lot is new new work um, but I, I want to ask David to focus on on how this system improves water quality in the area and so maybe you could just sort of talk about the parts of the system and nope that, that's fine I think uh, I would like to just kind of uh, touch base a little bit on exactly how the stormwater is conveyed from the hotel lot through the garage lot and perhaps if we can shut off the lights quickly um, we can at least touch base on that so under today's conditions pre-development conditions stormwater basically runs from the top left of the drawing to the bottom right down to the confluence of the north branch and the Winooski river and that occurs in a series of stormwater pipes so if we go i don't know if you're going to see it on this one but if you could basically just take the cursor to the left and uh keep going out in front of the hotel and uh, actually off the drawing oh <laughs> or I could do that. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so bear with me while I do I have the other drawings with us. Tease this do. mouse into doing what. So right now there's a low point that's kind of right here, and uh, a majority of the site all drains to that particular location. It's it's uh, much lower, maybe four to six feet lower than uh, the other portions of the existing parking lot that runs out in this particular. Um, that occupies, I should say, the eastern and, and southern portions of this particular so the, area. The river is over here. I can um, hang on a minute. Sorry, I'll get north, us back. North on this plan is up. So there we go. That's a little cleaner. So here's the hotel property. Here's the, the the Central Vermont Railroad. This is the North Branch. This is all Taylor Street here, but there's the actual main channel of the Winooski River yeah. there. And the low spot that Dave's talking about, anybody who parks there today or drives through there on a regular basis knows that there's just this big pothole kind of thing right near the red shed. That, that when you drive in, you sort of slope down from Taylor Street pretty significantly and then slope back up to get out. Sorry, Dave. Well, you have the mouse working a lot better than I did. So. Maybe it's because I'm closer. Uh, so. so. Uh, with that, there's actually three projects that are integral to the stormwater uh, component. Uh, down in the bottom right of that particular drawing, uh, Greg, if you can just put the mouse on the shared use path. Um, yep. And this is currently is under cute? construction, Sorry. or at least it's beginning construction today. And yeah. part of that contract is to replace the outfall that again takes the pothole stormwater, as Greg describes it which is all conveyed in the southeasterly direction from top left to bottom right. And the last section of that existing stormwater conveyance uh, piping is being replaced as part of the shared use uh, path project. And from there, the hotel project uh, originally had, again, relocated the stormwater conveyance system in a way that would tie into that particular shared use, use contract component uh, and then what this particular project does as far as the garage it basically uh, allows the stormwater now I will take this and uh, okay so it basically takes the stormwater from this far top left area and brings it down through the garage and then basically paralleling the railroad tracks and then discharging out in the bottom right of this particular drive so that concept has been the same, whether it be the hotel project uh, with its own garage system or whether it be with this particular city garage, expanded city garage uh, project. Uh, what is different on this particular one is that all the drops of water that fall out of the sky and um, basically end up on the top deck, uh, all are collected and it's treated, no pun intended, um, just like a parking lot. 
ex under today's conditions, all the runoff from the parking lot goes into the stormwater collection system, goes directly into the river without any treatment at all. <coughs> this particular system, I won't speak for the hotel project, but as far as at least the garage itself, all the drops of water that fall on top of the garage were all collected and sent to a filtration system. Uh, this particular filtration system is designed to uh, handle the first inch of runoff. That's typically where uh, the majority of the contaminants are uh, dislodged in that first inch of rain. And in that particular system, it uh, has a settling component for the large diameter solids that may come out so it can be readily um, maintained or accessed in the future for removal of those solids. And then once it's, uh, then it settles down through that particular storage system into an underlying sand filter before it leaves through an under drain collection system and then uh, goes to uh, the discharge system that we talked about that's part of the shared use path today. Where, where is that uh, the filtration system? So right currently there? that filtration system is located down in the, off the southeast corner of the proposed garage. We're working through some issues with Public Works as far as, again, making sure that there's ready access in this particular area. It typically will be a low maintenance component, primarily because the intent of this particular parking garage is not to use road sand on the surface. So if you could imagine in a, a normal parking lot on surface, uh, you're dealing with winter conditions, winter sanding. Uh, those particular particles have a tendency to migrate downhill with the flows of large storm events into the collection system and ultimately, under today's conditions, out to the river. Uh, this particular proposed parking garage actually displaces all of that old school parking lot in favor of a system that A, doesn't require uh, the winter sand uh, approach uh, that typically the today's parking lot does. And then in t on top of that includes the treatment system. So we feel that a significant component of this particular portion of the city's parking facilities will have significant, excuse me, significant improvements in water quality uh, from this particular um, area of the site. Now, I remember last time that <clears throat> the, the top level stormwater management was the uh, hydrodynamics uh, separator centrifuge. Yes. And I, that's been changed now to a storm tech uh, sand filtration system. And what, what, what is the new system being proposed? Well, the new system, uh, I didn't do a very good job of introducing it, but it is a series of underground chambers that uh, have a dedicated area for initial inflow where those any solids that get in typically would settle out. And then the flow will move through that galley or chamber system. Is this going to be a gravity-fed system? Yes, it is. Okay. All fully gravity. Uh, and then ultimately it moves vertically downward through an underlying filter, sand filter. Um, sheet 2.4 shows some of the components. I, if you would like to get that, that's fine. Uh, you've asked some good pointed questions, so this would be perhaps an opportunity to uh, allow us all to get a little bit more familiar with uh, this particular uh, system. The thing that we talked about last time is we did talk about the hydrodynamic separators. And those are very uh, good systems for small surface areas or at least areas where you have a small amount of um, area for treatment. Uh, what we have found with the state's stormwater management program is that for the redevelopment uh, uh, component of the regulations, the new regulations uh, adopted in 2017, that those hydrodynamic, uh, or I should say this particular system is preferred by the state stormwater management group because of the improved uh, treatment capacity. <coughs> uh, it does a much better job of basically removing the very, very fine particles. And uh, that is ultimately the direction that the stormwater management program at the state uh, directed us to move towards as part of this particular application. Uh, so Greg, if you can zoom in on the bottom left. Sure. Uh, this will represent the various components in a cross-section. So if you basically uh, cut a section through the underground area, these are the, function, uh, the components that you would see. So starting at the very top, we basically have the land surface that 
and we have a certain amount of material over the top just to distribute loads and to protect the chambers. You can see those half oval shape uh, features. Thank you. Um, those are hollow. Uh, on the outside, you have crushed stone with a high porosity to basically provide some storage of water as it gets introduced into those particular chambers. It fills the chambers. It also is, is um, permeable or porous, so it's filling up the entire void space, starting from the bottom of the chambers up. And then as your infiltration rates allow, the drops of water move vertically down from the chambers through stone, that's the underlying stone that provides the structural integrity of that chamber system, ultimately into the 18 inches of sand filter underneath. And that is your final polishing component as far as stormwater coming off of the garage surface and being introduced into the system. And then on the very bottom you have the under drains uh, that basically take the filtered water and convey it into that <coughs> final discharge from the site to the river. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? I, I, I just want to note that uh, the uh, hydrodynamic catch basins are still a feature on the original hotel site where we have much smaller catchment areas to deal with. Um, and because this is a flood district, I think all the underground utilities are going to have gasketed covers on their access points. And yes, uh, there are some internal components of the garage that we had spoken about last time uh, in which we wanted to make sure that we weren't taking floodwaters, sending them down into the sanitary drains and heading them down to the treatment plant. So in this particular case, all of those have been designed in a manner that basically allows for them to be protected, or at least the treatment plant should be protected from those particular types of inflows. Um, and we're also working on the final details with Public Works on, again, how to protect this feature from floodwaters also. And these are the features that they had concerns about accessing under the boardwalk? That is correct. Yeah. So in this particular case, actually, this particular type of system can be put underneath a building if you chose to do so. Um, it's one that we like to try to locate outside of buildings if we can. They're put underneath parking lots very frequently. Um, what we want to do is basically make sure that from a, from a maintenance standpoint, that Public Works, with its particular resources, can access this. Uh, so we've talked with Public Works not only about this location and how to modify the access points to avoid the conflict with the, uh, the various walkway components, but at the same time perhaps even to relocate that into a different corner of the building to carry the day. So, But at this point in time, this is what our proposal is to uh, satisfy the state permitting and with tweaks on the manhole access points to find uh, the best way for public works um, access, manual access into, these, into this particular structure. And what's the final design is, is, is agreed upon. I, uh, there will be an agreement that will sort of lay out the various easement rights, and maintenance and all of that describing which party will be responsible for what over the life of the project. That might be more of a question for Randall. Well, I, th I think in, in terms of maintaining the systems that Dave's describing tonight, that those are those are city problems. Okay. Yeah. Um, so at this point in time... There are shared yeah. easements uh, in order to allow the hotel property to drain through this lot and onto the outlet at the, uh, okay. at the, at the river. But Yes, uh, Public Works did good, do, do a nice job of identifying what they would and wouldn't uh, be responsible for within the hotel site. Uh, but Greg hits it right on the head that this particular uh, parcel, we'll call it, or at least the site plan for the parking garage is basically a system that is only only takes city water and, uh, and only needs to take city water. So no shared responsibilities there. So do you still require state approval or do you have yes. that? Yeah, that, have to that application state. has been formulated, applications have been signed, and checks have been written. Um, and that I'll, I'll, at, the end, at the end of this tonight, I'll give you a summary on uh, sort of where we are with other permits, if you wish. Speaking of uh, water on the top floor, yes. uh, snow. Yes. What's, what's going on with that? 
Well, uh, the plan has has been to uh, melt that snow, mm -hmm. and uh, we gave the city two options to do that. One, uh, or the, the, we gave the city one option. They came up with the, another of their own. Uh, there's a towable piece of equipment called a snow dragon, where you just as you scoop the as you scoop the snow up, you put it in there and it melts it into a tank at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, but Public Works has asked us to, uh, to take another approach, which is to uh, use district heat to provide for a radiant slab at the top level. Um, the design changes that have accrued to the uh, intermediate levels make us really confident that we're not going to have a lot of snow and rain blowing into the intermediate levels. Um, but uh, for, the, for that top level, which will, which will get snow, um, we, we decided that that'll uh, That'll melt into into the drainage system that's throughout the garage. There are great, there are drains periodically on every level in many many places to uh, to direct stormwater flows into Dave's system. Um. Other than the easement for district heat, is there any uh, you know? difference between whether they use the snow dragon or whether they use district heat no I, th I think the bottom line is is that we are not proposing to drop snow from three and a half stories down uh, we aren't indicating on the site plan any place where we want to pile snow up in this particular case what's been happening in the Capitol Plaza lot for a long time is the city scoops that up into uh, dump trucks and takes it away and there's a spot under a bridge where they where they let it pile up over the winter um, but all that truck time and stuff is, is an expense. It takes, takes person hours to do it. Um, so uh, uh, I think we all settled on the idea that using, using a snow melt technology would be an appropriate response. Um, I also, we also talked a little bit, I, I guess I gotta make sure I get to the right plan. I think we've already, Broach the subject of, of stop signs and things associated with, with the site plan, but I just want to find that plan real quick. Was there anything new since the last meeting? Uh, well, I don't think this plan was in your set last time, but it's there now, just showing where stop signs would be, where okay. yield signs would be. Then let's go over it. Okay. Um, so, in terms of traffic control, we've talked about the volume of traffic. Um, We've agreed with Public Works that there would be stop signs at the exit points, both at Taylor Street and State, normal stop signs with stop bars. We'll also require stop traffic going west to east on the internal road here at the crosswalk. Obviously, we want to stop people uh, if, you know, uh, yield to pedestrians right through here because this is a major pedestrian corridor. Also, a stop sign for people coming from the church out to um, make them pause and, and just look to their left and make sure there's nobody coming out of the garage. Um, there are directional indications here for Inter Interstate 89 and Route 2. Uh, it is the preferred choice that they go out through the internal road to Taylor Street if they're heading out to the interstate. Um, and so we have several signs um, uh, indicating that. Also another sign making clear that uh, the church parking is private and uh, a small stop sign at the, at the emergency exit we expect it will favor traffic to the overlook uh, neighbor here and the bike path um, but this is this is a low frequency thing um, so I just wanted to uh, just get that out of the way since we've talked to David about traffic um, Everything else that's been that, that's been done is really a sort of firming up of details and, and answering questions for public works. Uh, uh, I don't know if, if you if you want to take the time to go through any of these detail sheets. Uh, they're all in your set though, um, and so I do want to talk a little bit about the sort of final shape and positioning of the building. Um, one other thing I will, I will mention, because I know it's of a concern to people, we've spoken throughout our process about how the project would be designed to not have a negative impact on, on flood water in town. That's a little different than storm water. Um, Dubois and King prepared a uh, detailed computer analytical model of the watershed. Uh, we put the building volumes and, and the uh, grade manipulations from the project into that model and have determined that the project will not have an adverse impact on stormwater flows. Uh, 
uh, I, I believe it was characterized to me, and Ron, you can yell at me if I'm wrong, but uh, in a 500-year flood event, we're talking about possibly raising water in this area by a quarter of an inch, which is considered acceptable in, the, in terms of the no-rise policy. Um, I just wanted to pass that along because that work has been completed. It's really uh, more of a more to deal with our Act 250 level review, but um, I did want to pass that along since we're talking about utilities. Uh, <coughs> Does the board have any concerns before we move along? I just wanted to ask a question about pedestrian safety. Yes. Um, and the um, the my question is: When you do a traffic study, you're looking just at cars, or are you looking at the interaction between cars and pedestrians? And did you take in, that into account in in that traffic study? So this traffic study did not look at the internal flows to the site. So. Um, <clears throat> That's so your question, but also, yep. yeah, I mean, we, we did look at, you know, the, we counted pedestrians, we looked at them, but they didn't play a role in our analysis. I see. They weren't, you know, they weren't of concern in this situation from, for the site driveway and the major intersections. Well, um, I, I, I do want to sort of talk a little bit about this. Right now, what happens is there's, there is, there are 206 parking spaces behind the Capitol Plaza now. Okay. A lot of people in town park back there because the city's got long-term leases on a good chunk of it. And um, as you can see here in the existing conditions plan, <coughs> um, wherever you park here, there are no dedicated pedestrian ways or wayfinding of any kind. Um, in the proposed layout, um, you know, we've got a fairly substantial uh, channeling of the traffic into a defined roadway and we have some defined pedestrian paths that get you from the hotel and the garage via two crosswalks here and here out to State Street. Um, there's also pedestrian connectivity indicated going east to uh, west to east along the north side of the garage to connect the Capitol Plaza lot and all of this to the Haney lot. A lot of people use that as a cut through. Uh, and then this pedestrian line connects down here to the to the uh, rec path. Um, so while it's it's not perfect, it's a significant improvement over existing conditions. Uh, I can see that with all of the internal flow. I guess what I'm curious about is that uh, the State Street exit. Okay. And um, and that just comes from personal experience. You know, farmers market days. Uh, seeing people trying to take a left in to the lot to find a spot um, now and and uh, and not being patient to wait for the pedestrians to kind of cross there okay. have, have so maybe that stop sign for coming out is helpful yeah and I don't know if there is one there today I don't believe so there's none now no so but, that will help but it's really thinking about the left turn in and so maybe that's the question about having that left turn lane is really about patience for pedestrians that may be passing by. But once someone has a dedicated lane, they might be more patient if people aren't behind them. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. I see our director of public works is uh, uh, waiting in the wings here. And Thank you. Tom, could you, sure. could you join us? Um, so we, do, do you need this, this, this uh, uh, yeah, number? Yeah, Okay. So through the, uh, well, this is the uh, easement plan again. Though. Yeah, what would you like, Tom? Uh, your traffic control plan. So back to um, Mark Boyd's question as well. But if you look in the, the Heaney lot, uh, there is a um, lane, presumably that's a lane, uh, white lines, edge lines, and the bike lane symbols. Uh, that. According to our in-house um, uh, person knowledgeable of bike lane design, that's not appropriate. We shouldn't be marking that as a, as a bike lane. Uh, that is in our staff comments. Uh, the the shared use path is designed as a as a bicycle facility, meeting all of the uh, Ashto standards and requirements for for a uh, shared use path, uh, which includes bicycles. Uh, these are pedestrian walkways uh, designed for pedestrian use. Uh, that um, may be misleading through the through that parking lot to lay out a, a bike lane. 
um, which then reaches the back corner, or you could, a, a person could choose either way, but neither is appropriate for bike use. You can walk your bike there, that's fine. But that's, that's all I wanted to point out when you're looking at this plan that, that should be removed. This, these symbols, right? Correct, here. yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Anybody else have a comment on that? Because if not, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. So, but some <coughs> other form of symbol potentially to mark that as some sort of access point to get to the back, even if it's not a bicycle symbol? Would I would not mark a uh, pedestrian or a pedestrian, a uh, bicycle or a pedestrian way unless it met okay. the standard for one or both. Okay, so would you even mark it out as a specific I lane? Think it's better that pedestrians make their way through or that parking lot uh, that they always have. Okay. Uh, it's very common practice for parking lots of that type to uh, not have any marked area. So I don't want to be misleading with that. Nope, I just wanted to be really clear as to what you wanted there. Sure, thank you. So I had a couple of questions. Uh, has there been a final determination of the number of electronic uh, charging stations that will be included? We're we're going to set the we're going to set the garage up for 20. Okay. And we I had I presented uh, cut sheets for those previously. Um, I think there's going to have to be a policy discussion about whether or not those are exclusive use or not, and it just depends on. I think that's a management issue. It really shouldn't be a permitting issue. Um, if, if the city finds they're not getting penetration, if they're not getting uh, a lot of use, you really don't want to take that many spaces out of circulation altogether. They, so I, th I think I think that might be an iterative thing as far as how they get labeled. Um, I guess going back to Deb's point, what uh, is there? Are there any changes to that crosswalk uh, kind of across the new State Street entrance to the project site? Is that is that going to be pretty much as it currently exists, or is there a new markings there? I guess the stop sign we've discussed. Any other changes to improve? There, well, on the project site, there'd be stop bars and, and, a, and the pavement marking saying stop. I, I, th I think if there was an improvement on this side, it would be in the city right away, right? Tom. So our our standard for um, streets, roads, intersections. Um, is to not have a, a concrete walkway across them and they're, they're a marked crosswalk. You may have noticed that we did made a change at Stone at Stonecutter's Way um, this summer, um, removing the concrete and painting a crosswalk there. Um, this is a um, an access easement. It has a lot of similarities to a street. I suppose we could look at it that way, removing the concrete, which provides separation and provides a visual cue to motorists that that's a pedestrian way. Um, so I, I think either um, is suitable. I think the marked crosswalk is more visible, but um, as you know, concrete remains year-round. Crosswalks tend to wear off and it's a little more higher maintenance. Um, so I think either way, they indicate they provide the, the necessary visual cues that that's a pedestrian way and the pedestrian has the right of way. So I'm not sure that this really rises to the level with the um, additional park uh, vehicular traffic to warrant any different changes. As I've been pointed out, there are uh, a lot of parking spaces there now and um, the additional parking doesn't, doesn't change things that dramatically. Um, I'm not aware of any um, complaints or concerns raised about pedestrian safety there. And I think because of slow, slow traffic, visibility is key. I'd be a little concerned. We want to look closely at a, at a left turn lane. Um, sometimes a waiting vehicle can prevent uh, visibility of somebody through car going around it, um, particularly for the crosswalk on State Street. So we've got to weigh, balance that. What are we gaining and what are we achieving? But I think it's fine as designed. It's a, it's a concrete crosswalk, uh, sidewalk that serves as a, as a de facto crosswalk. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Where would you like to take us next? Um, 
Mr. Chair, is, do you want to take comments on pedestrian safety and traffic before they jump into wastewater, or do you want to? Well, I'm, my, my thinking was, and this is this is a point of discussion. My thinking was was to get through the new material and then to open it up to the public. Board members, what do you think? Should we take it at each phase uh, upon request of a public, or should we wait till the end and and then take comment? Uh, I think I'd leave it up to the applicant's representatives. I mean, if you'd rather keep going with the changes you're presenting or if you want to have a pause and hear some response per uh, item. You know, I could go either way. I think, uh, you know, in terms of wastewater disposal, that's a fairly short discussion. And then I was just going to go around the uh, outside of the building and talk about the design changes that have come up. But uh, if, if people want to keep their train of thought, that's fine with me. I think it makes sense to finish hearing from the applicant and then, and then, and we'll, then pay and then attention we'll to comments. Okay. Ms. Yeah. Whitaker, is that so um, between Dave and Ron, who would like to talk about sanitary sewers? Mine's easy. <laughs> I'll go first. So go go for one. Uh, again, Dave Marshall. Um, on the garage, um, the way the federal regulations work is that any drop of water that starts inside of the building and gets collected is considered to be a sanitary waste. So even though you might think of those drops of water coming off your car as they melt in the snow and hitting the floor and draining, dribbling off to the drain, or as stormwater, it actually technically is a sanitary waste. And so that every level below the roof is considered to be something where we have sanitary sewer collection systems and conveyance systems. In this particular case, the garage has been set up so that all of those particular collected uh, sanitary waste go to an oil water separator prior to being introduced into the sanitary collection system. That happens to be conveniently located just off to the right or east side of the proposed building. Um, what we also did in working with Public Works was to figure out a system that would, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, avoid a situation where we're funneling uh, floodwaters into that particular sanitary collection system that is essentially all ends up down at the wastewater treatment facility. So those are the components that have been integrated into the parking garage. There is no uh, bathrooms, uh, so we don't have any traditional waste streams uh, that otherwise would have to be managed. So uh, from that standpoint, other than perhaps a small sink um, within an enclosed area, for maintenance purposes, um, our sanitary needs are fairly minimal. And so it's going right into a piping system, so there's no overflow risks uh, and risks to the river. That is correct. Okay. Um, I think for the hotel, it's actually an even a simpler s solution. We just run a pipe from the hotel to the State Street sewer that has capacity. So we tried to introduce yourself, so. We're online with the Boise King Engineers. You can see right here. Right so that uh, that's very very simple. It's everything sealed up. It's a flood uh, floodplain area, so you've got sealed covers and such as required. But it's basically just a lateral. We could have a house, except it's a little bigger. And water supply. I don't know if you, Ron, if you want to continue on with that. Uh, but water supply is almost the same as a house lateral. You, uh, just a bigger pipe going to the hotel, coming down from State Street, from or, uh, State Street down to uh, to the hotel from the State Street entrance. There will be a connection, possibly for future connection. The city of uh, DPW has asked us to put in a larger pipe, so in case there's a connection for that system in the future to uh, connect over to the east. Um, but in general, our hotel has a there's a maintenance pipe, there's a hydrant at the church we have to supply, so it requires a minimal maintenance up to that hydrant. And then it'll be a six inch or uh, six inch or four inch level hotel actually. And the garage will have a, a, a dry suppression system, so it'll have dry standpipes in each of the two stairwells and, and uh, dry pendant type heads throughout the garage for fire suppression. Um, that system is not normally charged unless there's a fire. Um, and I think there was some discussion at a previous hearing about 
us requiring heat in the building for the purposes of fire suppression system, and that's that's uh, that's not true. The uh, um, the building will not require heat for the fire suppression system to function. Um, and we've worked with Public Works and the fire department to, to understand what they wanted. Basically, the standpipes were the fire department's biggest issue. Um, I'm, I'm sure. sorry, Greg. Sorry, just because, um, so you don't need the controls for the standpipes and the sprinkler system, that control to be in the heated room? The, um, there's a... Uh, like a closet or something with a, a control for it. We've talked about this before. We were going to have a server closet for uh, the operational equipment of the, uh, um, uh, you know, the that runs the traffic functions of the garage. Right. Um, all I really need that that's uh, in addition to that for this dry suppression system is a, is a compressor. That's right. not so, a very big one. Right, but that's but that is that little piece has to be in a warmed room, right? Okay, good. I just want to uh, make sure. For the I'm not sure a compressor does, <laughs> but we will put okay. it in a warm room. Yeah, that's uh, that's my understanding from the fire chief and the comments I've incorporated in here. So I want right. to just confirm with you back and forth which which was the right thing and for the right. public because I know there was a question and that, that issue might have been confused. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been involved in literally hundreds of these types of systems. So and I think we pretty much have a good idea what works for them. But it's whatever the fire department needs. Yep. Um, the only other utilities, uh, there are there is not national natural gas on the site. Uh, there is a propane tank farm that serves the hotel, but that's part of the previous approval. Um, from time to time, we get comments about making sure that those are flood proofed, and they will be. They'll have uh, ballasts underneath them and tie down straps. Um, those details were previously submitted. So the only other uh, the only other utility on site is the electrical. Uh, Green Mountain Power has a main transmission line that runs down the southerly property border boundary. Uh, we are going to. Uh, branch from an existing overhead pole underground to service the site and um, I think one of these plans shows where we're expecting transformers. Do you remember what the number is? The site utility plan C1.1. Okay, so we'll go all the way up here then. It used to be, be a little easier if I scroll down here. Too much. That's good. Okay, so this dark shaded area here, where my cursor is, and this dark shaded area here, are the two proposed transclosure vaults, and um, those would be mostly underground. Then the transformer thing sits on top. But um, this this is uh, this is for the hotel part of it, and uh, all the electrical on site will be underground. Uh, the easement plan shows. The appropriate easements for these utilities to route their way to serve the existing capital plaza and the commercial spaces on its ground floor, as well as um, as well as the New Hampton Inn, and then um, loop. I guess the uh, extend existing power back to some of these adjacent users who are currently coming off of overhead lines that run right through the footprint of the garage. And these meet all sort of flood standards. Yes. Yes, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, anything that could float away or in a flood has to be bolted down and tied to something. I, uh, uh, in terms of general equipment in a garage, our solution to that is that we're not going to put anything below the first floor. That's good. Um, but as far as these utility vaults and stuff go, those are all those will all have gasketed lids and. Um, yeah. The. Um so when Greg mentions the transformers, they're typically placed on precast concrete vaults. Um, and in this particular case, the vault has to be placed high enough so the actual transformer structure itself, the metal green component or cabinet, is actually above the, the base flood elevation of 525.8. So that's going to be a component that is necessary in order to satisfy the, the flood uh, protection component. That's great. They're essentially a, a waterproof vault, aren't they? I'm sorry, Skip. Are, are, the, are the transformers essentially kept in the, basically they're waterproof vaults? I don't know if you want to call them waterproof. Um, 
They're designed to be weather protected so that the equipment inside is not beat up by Mother Nature. Um, waterproof might be pushing it a tad, though. I've seen water in them. So, so that would be why you have to lift it all the way up above the BFE. Although, is it above BFE or above DFE? Because the DFE is the, what, two feet above BFE? That, yeah, I don't have that answer for you, Mary. Okay. But, but anyway, that's a floodplain permit, which we don't do. Um, let's try to figure out here if I can. You need a light on? No, I just I just need to get back to my root directory somehow. Um, the changes on the building have been fairly subtle, but our work with Design Advisory has focused on. Uh, um, I just want to find the renderings here. Here we go. A uh, couple of things uh, that, that were worked out with Design Advisory Board, and, and this image will sh is a view from the, the bike path as you cross the north branch of the Winooski River and arrive at the garage. Um, we, uh, working with them, um, have kind of remodulated the facade a little bit to, uh, there was a big arch on the previous version that I think you saw. Um, this, that's been removed in favor of raising up this boardwalk between the garage and the, and the bike path. So when you come off the bike path bridge, you're going to end up, there's, gonna, there's this little like pocket area here, and you can see how it's, you know, it's enveloped in these little river birches. Um, there are benches and an opportunity for smaller, maybe more frequently changed art. Um, this, that was one of the changes requested by the Design Advisory Board, and we worked that out. Um, also, there were changes to these fences. We settled on a uniform form of that. I think we talked about that earlier. And then um, one last bigger issue, which I'm going to have to go back to the meeting minutes from the previous meeting to find this information, but um, we talked a lot about uh, how to... Um, the very top, option one. I think you're right. Sorry. Detail of art installation. Yes. Let me just rotate this view. Sorry. Um, th we presented a variety of, of, of ways in which we could do the infill on those big masonry openings. This is the one that the Design Advisory Board selected out of the choices we had. Um, the uh, original design showed sort of a pickup sticks kind of thing going on with colorful tubing. Uh, this is more um, traditional steel sections with bolts and welded connections and things framing a uh, sort of a major element at the top that acts as a sort of lintel to carry all the masonry above and then some st uh, steel bracing that, uh, that helps sort of cut the span of that down behind which and it doesn't show great here but is a uh, fiberglass scrim that's uh, breathable it allows the air in and out of the garage but it's also something we can print on a little bit and we were talking about ghosting on there a, a faint pattern of uh, you know artistic interest I've shown a bunch of gears here and stuff and thinking about this as being, you know, a sort of nod to the rail, the adjacent railway. Um, I think the Design Advisory Board in their recommendations to you uh, is suggesting that, that uh, there be some public process for sort of discussing this art and curating it a little bit. And we've talked about in general on the building design how there's, there are these big pieces of public art that um, that, that selecting that art ought to be a quasi, ought to be a public process, bringing into it the various and sundry uh, uh, legendary arts groups here in Montpelier, you know, Council on the Arts and and uh, some of the other groups who are interested in that sort of thing. So there's an opportunity for public involvement in sort of perfecting the design here. Uh, but out of the, all the different ways we thought about solving this problem, this is the one that they recommended, and we're perfectly happy with that. Go back to the rendering and show me where on that that we're what we're talking about. Sure. I think I just want to make sure I'm clear as to. Uh, of course. Let me just. Uh... So. See here where I had these yellow things happening. That was one of the three ideas. This is the one we've had for the longest, uh, but it wasn't the one they picked in the end. Uh, so where you see these yellow these yellow pipes here, instead what you would see. Is a, is a kind of a nutty, bolty steel frame 
which is very much intended to sort of call back the uh, trestle bridges that so define this area. You know, you've the one across Taylor Street, this one heading across the North Branch. Um, so I was felt uh, more sort of a more of a nod to the context by doing that. And so anytime you see this, which happens on all four corners of the building, uh, you would get that design element. It's just a huge amount of time goes into making these models, and we just couldn't we just couldn't remodel it for the fourth so or fifth time. Just moving along because it's ten to nine now. I just yep. want to bring this this part of the uh, presentation uh, to completion. Is, is there more that you would? No, I think, I think with the design issues, I just wanted to bring you up to date. All I'll say in, in sort of closing, uh, as far as our, our, our take on it, is, is uh, Design Advisory Board had, uh, I believe, seven recommendations and a couple of other things, uh, but uh, generally voted to move this on to you. Um, I'll just say that, uh, speaking for the applicant, that the recommendations of the Design Advisory Board are amenable and, and we're happy to to uh, stipulate to those. Okay. Tom. Two questions. One, uh, I see in some of the plans that there's going to be outdoor seating there. Is, and I, on this plan here, I see outdoor seating. Yes. How many uh, outdoor seatings are you going to have? Um, let me just quickly find the site plan. Uh, we have five or six benches on the boardwalk area. Okay. Our James Finley, Sheriff's Landscape Architect. Yep. Um, and uh, we also have uh, working with the sign, the wayfinding and signage, we have this idea where we have wayfinding and a, and, a, and a small bench opportunity at four locations within the site plan. Right. So I counted, I counted five on the board. Yeah, board. one of them got turned into a yeah. sign slash. Yeah. And the other thing uh, was there was uh, I think some discussion from the police chief about fencing uh, for underneath the, uh, the 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 boardwalk here. Has that yes. been? Has, has that been? It's 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 uh, it's the same detail that we would use for the other fencing. So it's that square grid. Um, we we uh, have said that uh, site where it happens on the site along the top of retaining walls and and the like that it will be left a, a natural galvanized. Where it's, it becomes a part of the building architecture, it'll be powder coated black. So you would have that in the openings on the on the ground floor that happens there. But it's also indicated on the civil plans, and, and I think it's on your plan as well, that underneath the boardwalk that that'll extend down to the grade as well. So that, so that to the extent we're creating a hollow space under here, that won't, you won't be able to get into that. Anything else from the board? I just, there was, I think there was a question raised in the comments earlier uh, about whether or not the 20, there's a 20 foot setback from the river. Oh, good point. Um, there was a comment in the staff notes, and we talked about this last time, about the other side of the board having previously determined to be channelized, so maybe there's no setback required. Um, where, where are you on that? That is, in fact, the determination that I think is supported by our work with the uh, floodplain district floodplain manager as well. Um, but it's our conclusion that the north branch of the Winooski River is channelized. Okay. By virtue of all the impounded fill, and it's, it's no longer a natural sort of riparian waterway. Um, a lot of this section of the, the river has actually got stone riprap walls on it, but um, by virtue of all the fill and everything and the buildings in place, uh, that's been determined to be channelized, which would require no setback. Uh, the only thing that might have violated a potential setback, the building itself met it, but it was the accessibility ramp, uh, the bike ramp slash access ramp here. This little corner of the ramp kind of came down close, but even, even at that, I think you're allowed to impact up to 50% of that setback. But I think I think the applicant's position is that there's no setback required because the river is channelized. Okay. And the building itself is 20 feet from? Garage is, is uh, 20 feet plus some. Uh, a little buffer in there, not much, inches. Um, but yes, from but the, the top of that. Just the, the, the first landing on the accessibility ramp uh, enters that space, but it's completely open underneath. You know, so there's, it's not impounding anything or restricting anything. So can I just clarify that uh, you spoke with the regional floodplain manager? Ned Swanberg. And, and that was Ned's assessment? Or yes. is it yours? Yeah. Oh, yes. Correct. Okay, so it's the state's Ron, assessment. Ron Lyons' firm has been the one doing the most direct work with Ned. Uh, but in our meeting with him, he outlined what the standards were and the ultimately the report or the study. Um, 
um, came to conclusion that there were minimal impacts in the flood level elevations, virtually no change in velocities as far as what was moving through the area, and as such, uh, we f easily fell within the no adverse impact. Uh, That's right. Okay. Range uh, that was acceptable from their, that department, but I think we've gotten. Uh, they've accepted this, the model, from what I understand, and at this point, uh, they've asked us to submit some other standard items that go with their review, which point they'll be able to provide the final final report uh, of their findings. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. At this point, I'm going to call a five-minute recess. We will reconvene at 9 o'clock, and uh, we will open it for public uh, comment. Um, there will be uh, opportunity for the board to uh, ask further questions as well as involving the applicant. So until 9 o'clock. Okay, let's reconvene. So at this juncture, we're going to uh, take testimony from the public. And uh, so those that would like to, to um, uh, make a statement or, or have other matters you wish to discuss, I'm going to ask you to keep your comments to a reasonable length of time, a couple, couple to three minutes. Um, and uh, at this point, I'm opening it up. So who would like to go? And when you comment, please make sure to come up to the microphone state your name and make sure you have signed in on the sign-in sheet so that we have your addresses for mailing purposes afterwards. Well, I can't keep mine to three because there's we've got four topic areas of process, uh, traffic, stormwater, et cetera. And as, long as, they, as long as they are germane to the applications. Yeah. Um, They're germane. Okay. Uh, I have raised earlier and in support of the need for the balloon validation of the perspective view impacts. I want to use these two as an example. You saw, see this one earlier where this 35-foot railroad bridge appears to be about six or eight feet above the height of the garage on that one. Whereas this new one we just see shows this thing 10, 20 feet higher than the railroad bridge. So they both can't be right. And the only solution is to have the design review board order the balloon validation testing as was suggested by an architect witness uh, at a prior hearing. Um, that is an essential validated, independently validated balloon heights with photographs from various angles around town. You're not going to be able to assess the view impacts otherwise. We cannot let tomorrow's vote drive a corruption of this process. This thing has been rushed and rushed and rushed and too many corners have been cut. We're facing on the eve of this bond vote, 16 million with 30 years interest, a rushed review and the design development review board is the final check and balance that can hold, bring some accountability and due diligence back into this process. That will necessitate you slowing down and doing your due diligence. We have, we don't have a contract yet with the architect. The architect just told me he hasn't been paid at all. And we have not, we've, we're arguing over whether the architect needs to produce the 3D models so that independent verification of these view impacts and view corridors could be done by a third party architect. Those are public records, work made for hire. I know it's not for this body to adjudicate that, but you ought to understand that we, we, will have, we <coughs> are accruing a bill as work made for hire of the 3D models of this garage, and they are necessary in order to do the due diligence and independent review. The traffic pedestrian, I, I especially first want to focus on pedestrian safety. And I won't try to call up, in the interest of time, call up the, the pass. The three-way stop at the entrance exit to the garage, the church parking, and the L-shaped egress through Taylor and State. You have most, if most of the 
garage users exiting there, crossing at a stop sign, getting shifting, crossing another section of the parking lot on a sidewalk, crossing the bank drive up lanes, and getting onto a sidewalk that's already frequently congested where the Northfield Savings Bank entrance and ATM are located. And we're going to be pushing all this pedestrian traffic into that because we have not accommodated a sidewalk on the opposite side, which could be, uh, would have only the very low traffic volume of the church parking exit and reach State Street much more safely. It would require sacrificing some of the spots that are perpendicular. I've raised at the last meeting that the 35 foot frontage requirement, there's no way that you can allow that to be compressed down to 24 uh, on this private road easement and keep it and pass the straight face test. Um, I said, I'm gonna give you a written copy of this for slower reading. Uh, and I'll pass an electronic copy to Meredith as well. Uh, I'm going to offer a few photos just for educational purposes. Pass around. That is the elevation change between the Haney lot. And these were taken at the most recent farmer's market. Are these ones that we... No, these seen? are not. These, these are new ones that show the... Now I'm going to get to the traffic study. They show the amount of volume. We're talking thousands of cubic yards. Well, wait, let's, 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 let's back up for just a second. Sure. I want to make sure that we complete the first order of business that you were... Pedestrian traffic safety. Well, the, the, the issue with the balloons. These... Yes, I'm just say, asking you to order that test be done. Okay. Okay. And, and, and the materials you've given us... Just now, these are not uh, to support that. I'm going to just tell you what these are as I hand them to you. Those are illustrating the elevation where we're within a fractions of a percent of grade to reach the steep slopes, according to the surveyor. And the, illustrate, the, the photos that I'm taking illustrate the slope in that area. And there's another one that, at a higher level. But what they also do is they show the volume of material that's going to have to be removed. In a 115 by 215 foot garage, digging four, four or more feet down, we're going to be taking thousands of cubic yards out. The traffic impacts analysis has not accounted not only for the, all the dump trucks to remove all that material, possibly toxic, possibly contaminated, possibly flying toxic dust, et cetera. The traffic impacts analysis has not at all accounted for the internal flow or the displacement of the dozens and dozens of parking spaces that are going to be eliminated during construction. So you could potentially ruin the entire city's flow and enjoyability and safety for a solid year by having three construction projects going on simultaneously not to mention the traffic impacts of all the workers. So a, a comprehensive traffic impacts analysis must be done, not a piecing together of fragments of trip generation estimates that were done here and then and there for different pieces of this. This is a very complex combination of projects with massive impacts on not only the public safety but on the traffic flow and enjoyment of our city. So your argument at this point is on traffic flow? Yes. And you're concerned primarily with during construction, is that? No, as well as beyond. But the the bus study, there was a study done by Du Bois and King of the bus traffic, which we discovered necessitates the long buses not even being able to enter the transit center and turn around. So they're going to have to park across the street, blocking the access to the state lot and or the Chittenden Bank lot and require passengers to cross Taylor Street to get on the bus. So that study is still in draft form, hasn't been completed since last year. So since 2017. I, I don't know how the bus, where the buses park is determinative of flow counts and the, the You're going to block traffic 
be both to, behind the buses and in and out of the, the existing lots. Okay, but as far as trip generation, the background rates that the Du Bois and King study was used for aren't determinative of where buses park. Is that no? What I'm saying is they're related. That the the traffic flow analysis, remediation solutions analysis, and the traffic impacts on all the intersections and, and especially within this private easement road that that were that is not up to the 30 foot standard of, of frontage so steve it's, it sounds to me like your point has to do with pedestrian safety with the crossing of the streets it, that's uh, one point okay overall traffic impacts the inadequacy of the studies that have been done or the pieces of studies that have been kludged together to justify that this project is okay. That the, adding a third project on top of the hotel, on top of the transit center, is all just gonna be <coughs> in a hunky dory. So, so I, think I, th th I think I've got it. If I could just summarize what, I, what my understanding at this juncture is, is that the concern is about the traffic impacts and its effect on pedestrians in particular and specifically with three different construction projects going on at the same time. Correct. Uh, the walkability and the preservation and interconnection of existing trails and walkways, I walk through the farmer's market and people walk three and four abreast. We're going to now necessitate all of those people are going to funnel into a little wheelchair ramp in order to get down to the river to our new confluence park. Uh, both you're going to be creating two of these urban canyons, and this is the picture I took last night, which illustrates the a best case of an urban canyon uh, between a hotel parking strip, you know, retail four-story structures and parking garage. You're going to create an urban canyon between the Christchurch affordable housing project and this garage, as well as between the hotel and this garage that are not safe, that are not inviting, that are not uh, maintaining and enhancing the interconnection of trails. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up here because I know I exceeded my time. There's a need for independent verification of the renderings. This is off of Cherry Street? Correct. Yeah. In Berwyn. Yeah. And we would, th th those urban canyons are not something we should be aspiring to, or they're not in the nature of Montpelier. Mm -hmm. um, the visualization test and a comprehensive traffic impacts analysis are both things I'm asking this body to order, even if it means you can't vote to approve this thing as quickly as the city council would like you to. That this board has to be the adults in the room. The city council has taken on the role of developer promoter and it has compromised all of the offices of the cities in, in their due diligence of critical review, both economically. I have researched and, and verified that the cost of this green wall system, the water filtration systems, the air-conditioned room for the server equipment. None of these costs were built in. So Power a, washing and maintenance. We're, we're doing a site plan review. We're not reviewing the economic costs of the garage or anything in the city council. So you're saying that this board needs to be the one to focus on our job, which is to apply the regulations. It's very strict. And, and then you're talking primarily about things that are not in the regulations. Uh, it, so well, the walkability and the interconnection, in the, if, we're, if this has become not a hotel private garage but a city garage, why are not the elevators located closest to where the people who are going to be walking to the city? I mean, to, ha to ask people to enter the garage through the handy lot, which is their most easy access, and then have to go to the other end to get on the elevator is, is undue deference to the hotel. If the hotel wants a second elevator on its end, it can pay for that one. But this, this, the city's hotel should be on the end closest to the city businesses and restaurants. Bathrooms are essential in a public building with a $10 million cost. Otherwise, the parking structure is going to be used as a bathroom regardless, and we will have the increased maintenance costs of that. 
Um, since you have this in writing, I will not belabor this. One other thing, if the last year, I mean, at the last meeting, I presented a piece of the 2000 master plan, which included the conceptual design for not only the multi-use path bridge, but a traffic bridge across the North Branch. I'm not advocating for that, but I am saying that if we don't do our due diligence here and we create a traffic mess, we will have put this garage squarely blocking a potential tra traffic bridge across the first branch which would be a very traffic alleviating if expensive solution because it would hit Maine at Barry and allow people to get out in, in those directions. But we, that will become impossible if this garage of this size and scale goes in this location. Uh, I appreciate your... Okay, thank you. Yep, I appreciate your, I appreciate your uh, summary. Okay, so, uh, other, uh, others that would like to uh, testify? Anybody else? Um, One last item. D don't, an intan two intangibles are views and the cost of public faith and trust in this process. You could do severe damage to both of those. Before we, before we move on, let me, I want to go back and just clarify uh, the last question I had for the applicants on, just to make it clear that uh, I had asked about um, the, uh, whether or not the regional um, uh, rivers uh, person uh, determined that the river was channelized. Uh, at the location uh, in question, you know where we where where this building gets close to the North yeah. Branch. G given your concerns, I want to invite Ron up because Dubois and King were the primary authors of the model and have had most of the conversations with Ned. Um, but Ron, Thank if you're it's if because you're, we need to make a finding. Uh, no, it's it's fine because I may have paraphrased a conversation and and I think I think you uh, you're right to say we should probably refine that. Thank you. So. Uh, Online at New Mexico King, we did uh, traffic or uh, traffic uh, flood modeling study. Uh, we worked with Ned Swanberg uh, at the DEC uh, flood management to review that study. The study was the purpose of the study was to meet the regulations to say is there any adverse impact due to this flood or the uh, floodway? Or, I'm sorry, the flood plain by putting in the film. Uh, the the impacts uh, were determined to not cause an adverse impact. We submitted that model to Ned uh, Swanberg, and, uh, and he came back in a review and said, "No, there is no. We agree there is no adverse impact." But we did not do a determination on channelization in that study, nor did we directly ask him uh, if he would support channelization. So that. As far as I know, that was not asked and defined. Um, we did define, I think uh, the model came out uh, because of the configuration in that area. The model did come out that we can put the fill in that we need to get the finished floor above the base flood elevation uh, without doing any adverse impact, either to the velocity of flow in that area, floodway, or the elevation of the flood water in a 100 year storm. So, so let me follow up with you on that because I, th I think the reason I had that impression is because we talked about it at a design team meeting about the question. I think the question that uh, uh, Board Member Markowitz is looking for is, in your professional opinions, is this section of the river channelized or not? Because we talked about this and I thought the answer was right. yes. So that wasn't a Ned conversation, that was an us conversation? Yes, it was. Okay. And I think one of the things that we did is you asked for the definition of channelized I had two definitions from basically Corps of Engineer definitions and state definitions and said in a situation where a river is, has construction that's not the normal river banks, either riprap or um, construction that would channelize that river into an area that, that would be considered uh, channelized. Those are definitions, I think they're reasonable definitions and Corps of Engineers 
practical sense definitions in their permitting process. And then in the state definition, that was always also uh, what they used for a definition in, uh, in their river control manual, I think it was. But I think that's where the, def the discussion was within our meeting uh, of what channelized was. And to me, everything that I saw in that was that it's more of a normal, common sense definition if you have go into a normal river and put up uh, fill or put up uh, any kind of uh, structure that keeps that channel confined to what it was before is natural way than that's channelization. So, so would you conclude, in your professional opinion, is this section of the river that abuts the property channelized or not? Uh, upstream of the North Branch is very channelized. So it has buildings on both sides and apartments. This area is certainly channelized to some degree with uh, riprap and with construction of the railroad bridge. Would the, would the construction of the bike path bridge abutment be impactful on that in any way, meaningfully? I don't think the bridge abutment for the bike path, I haven't looked at that, but I don't think it's that and the fringes into the river okay. bank that significantly. The railroad bridge abutment definitely was created some many, many years ago. So, because I have two civil engineers here, I'll just ask Dave the same question. Do you have an opinion on channelization? Actually, we did talk to Ned about that in the one meeting that I went to. Um, and in particular, the reason I asked the question is that the state adopted a new program about river corridors. And the intent of the river corridor program is to basically preclude encroachment into what historically has been the overbank areas when a river when a river floods, it basically expands beyond its main channel area and overflows on the edges. And you get a lot of flood storage in those areas. And it helps, uh, again, ultimately with peak flows and the downgrading areas. And the reason I ask the question is that when we're dealing with downtowns, uh, there was a particular carve out in the statute that specifically talks about if you have a building that happens to be right next to the river, then somebody that's downstream of it probably should have the right to basically be that far or that close to the edge of the river too. And in this particular case, when you take a look at the river corridor mapping for Montpelier, it shows a very broad reach that under theoretical conditions would be where the river would have gone. And when you, unfortunately, don't have the benefit of that, but if you can kind of imagine this particular line that extends literally hundreds of feet from the top of the bank of the river, and you look at all of the historical development that's occurred, you know, right up to the edges of the top of the bank of the river itself, I asked Ned, I said, Ned, do we have any issues with river corridor issues? And it basically goes to the channelization component. He said, no, absolutely not. The historical way that Montpelier has been developed has created the channelization of the river. So it can no longer go in a comfortable way expanding itself during the flood events. It basically is all encumbered by these buildings and the historical fill that's been placed in the overbank areas. So in this particular case, our understanding of, of the channelization component was it was a no-brainer for Ned Swanberg from the river section that in this particular case, this area had been compromised in such a way and I look at it more specifically right adjacent, as uh, Greg indicated, there's a limited area that this particular lot actually fronts the river. But you have the railroad bridge that, again, as far as definitions of creating transportation improvements that literally create bottlenecks for the water, that is channelization. Uh, so we have that not only for the railroad bridge, but also for the brand new recreation path. Has it been designed to be back from, you know, the very edge of the river? Absolutely. Is it back at the top of the bank? Yes. But has it created a bottleneck where we've forced all the water to go where it naturally wouldn't want to go? The answer is yes. It has. So, in, in my opinion, the channelization is there. I understand from staff that the board has found on the opposite side of the river that that same situation is in force. Um, and it's just natural based on the historical development pattern of the downtown area that the conclusion of channelization has also been adopted on the opposite side of the river too. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay with that. Okay.
Okay. Yeah, I think the correct question, I was answering more the correct question. Yeah, okay. But no, nothing Dave said okay. gives you pause. It doesn't bother me at all. Okay, thank you. A any other uh, uh, party wish to wish to be heard? Oh, Mike, Mike Miller, the uh, planning director. Uh, yep, Mike Miller, I'm the planning director. Um, just for context for the board and for the public, um, when I'm speaking, um, obviously with city staff, it's always a little bit difficult to tell because we've got some people who may be representing the application. In this case, uh, Meredith and I are working on this side of the table, so um, kind of representing the review of the application. And following the previous meeting, um, Meredith had asked me to take a few minutes because of all of her workload to go and look at some of the questions that had come up on the renderings and the wireframes that maybe you had in your packets. And we wanted to just kind of go and get a sense of being able to just kind of put an independent eye that goes and says, let's take a look at these independently and see whether Greg's renderings are not correct or whether the you know where, where things are so what I did was went out and took a look at the different um, sites in particular um, this the <coughs> Keeney lot um, as it goes down and I'll pass around the wireframe but you probably have it in one of your packets somewhere um, And what you'll notice in those wireframes is in the center of that parking lot, there are actually three telephone poles. One telephone pole would actually be on this side of the parking structure. One would be in the middle of the parking structure, and one's going to be on the other side of the parking structure. Those poles, the two larger poles, the ones on the ends, are 40 to 43 feet high and are also slightly elevated from the ground. The one in the middle you'll notice there's a smaller pole that does not have a light on it. That smaller pole is uh, 34 feet high and is starting at basically the grade. So what I was trying to do is to try to start to look at perspective um, and then to try to you know, r reflect on the fact that the parking garage is going to be 39 feet tall. So it's going to be between the heights of those two telephone poles or those three telephone poles slightly taller than the one in the middle slightly lower than the ones on the ends. now everything's always about perspective are you taking a picture from up on the hill or are you taking it from on the bottom so obviously that will change your perspective of whether a building next to you is appears taller or shorter whether the trestle bridge looks taller or smaller it, it, some of that will come down to perspective if you look through your other pictures that also have those wireframes, I would use those telephone poles as a good guide. So my recommendation, my thought in speaking with Meredith about, you know, kind of getting a sense was, I'll let you kind of draw your own opinions based on those pictures. Um, but the idea was really, I don't necessarily think you need a balloon study to go and get a sense for how high the structure is going to be. We have electrical lines. We have telephone poles that can give you an eyeball of about how high this building is going to be. Now, the ground comes up in elevation, the building goes up in elevation, but the perspective of the power lines and back remains the same. So it really is, I just wanted to put that out as some evidence for you as you start to evaluate uh, the sense of whether we need to go and do additional studies on view sheds. Um, that I think you have some good information in your packets already to kind of make those determinations on your own. Mr. Rabino, could you, uh, is that your conclusion as well? Would that be a good, uh, I guess, uh, metric to work against? The, the, you know, the photos as presented, I'm not sure if you've seen these. That, that, that yeah. using you know, the telephone poles as a go-by is a perfectly yeah, this, rational way to do it. With this, these pictures here, yeah. with the telephone poles at the bottom, and then yeah. the other ones. Um, we, we construct the building models in Revit software, the same drawings we use to construct the buildings we use to construct these these visualizations, um, and then we we uh, took photographs of the site because Google Earth doesn't really have a very good inventory here. But we took photographs of the site from various directions, and we 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 integrate the photographs into the the models into these photographs based on cues from around surrounding buildings and stuff. 
Um, we've done scores of these, and they tend to, they, they, historically they've proven to be quite accurate. Um, so uh, I don't really I don't really feel like I need to respond to the to the public about this, but I, I'm confident that the drawings that were submitted for the purpose of the visual analysis, where they were integrated into actual site photographs, are as accurate as we're capable of making them, and that's pretty damn accurate. Uh, we did other 3D imagery where we dropped the model into a fake world of, of building plans that we made up for this purpose. Those are a little less precise because, you know, a lot of the context is just made up using, you know, just 10 foot floor to floor everywhere. Uh, so the drawing of the project when viewed from behind the shell station, I'm confident is pretty accurate that, you know, other views where we're trying to show you the bike path railing or something were never intended to serve that purpose. They were intended to illustrate our ideas. Even though they're built on the same model, um, the, the, the difference is, you know, when we, when we put the drawing into the, the picture, we can see that there's a little bit of the Capitol Plaza building standing up above it because it's a six-story tall building and this is a five-story tall building. Um, we could split hairs and say, is it taller or lower by a couple of feet? But in, in, the, in the main, I think this is a more than adequate representation of what the public would see of this project from various angles. And uh, I'll stand by our work product. Oh, I, I do want to add one other thing, though. I, just, just on the point of whether or not I should give my 3D computer models to, to members of the public so they can play with it, um, I, th I think if anybody in the public wants to challenge these things and they feel like they have expertise in it, they're welcome to put something together of their own. I don't see where they have to interfere with my contract or get my work product to do it. But that's a personal opinion. Anything further, board? I had some questions on the uh, exterior lighting and the landscaping. Cool. Um, could you talk a little bit about the exterior lighting plan and the where there will be um, exterior fixtures and about the lighting of the walkway that will be between the hotel and the parking garage and also the types of fixtures that will be um, along the bike path side? So the project is comprised basically of pole lights, 50 foot high city standard pole lights um, placed throughout the site by our um, lighting consultant. Those are uh, used in tandem with building sconces that are placed regularly around the building elevations. Again, um, the numbers and locations worked out by the lighting consultant to get the correct uh, foot candles. And will they be on all the time or will they be on? No, the they'll, be, they'll be in one of two things. Either they'll be on a timer um, or they'll be set, uh, they have new software now where you can set up all of the lights on a system so they um, can dim down to a certain percentage of light in the, throughout the night, but there'll also be motion sensors. So there's software that can go with it. At very least, they'll be on an astronomical uh, astro on a timer. Um, and then I had, a, I had a question about the landscaping. Is the, the ground cover that's being proposed in kind of what is the sunken area? Is that landscaping, that ground cover, going to extend underneath the boardwalk, or will there be a different type of ground cover that's underneath there? Underneath the boardwalk, we were expecting gravel, something like that. We're imagining the city might use it for storage or anything with like, uh, due to the lack of light coming down, I'm not sure anything would live under there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if, what the city intends to do if they wanted to pave that or whatever, but we were assuming just gravel so water would percolate down and flood that. Um, and I did have another question about bike parking. Is there any bike parking incorporated into this plan, or is the expectation that the bike parking would be on the transit center lot? And just thinking about how you would manage people using the fencing to lock their bikes up to. Which they probably will, no matter what we do. <laughs> um, we had proposed to put a, a, a bike rack system on the second floor of the garage in one of the corners where there, there's no parking spaces. Uh, it was suggested at Design Advisory today, and it's, it's uh, something we're amenable to, to, to put a bike rack out on the boardwalk area or adjacent to the boardwalk area. Um, but we're thinking there's two types of users. There's bike path users who want to stop and do something versus maybe commuters who need a place to keep their bike all day. And so that's our plan for bike storage. So there, so there, there will be a bike 
rack inside? Inside the garage okay. on level two. Okay. And how many bikes would it accommodate? Um, you know, nobody's given me a number. I was I was just going to use the same standard they use for lead, um, which I think is like five percent of building occupants or something like that. It's been a while since I took my test, but um, there's a there's a there's a leadership and environmental design um, standard for uh, for providing bike storage. Usually, so many per, per occupant. We would do it as a percentage of the garage parking. So would it take up one of the parking spaces, no. or it would be somewhere? It's it's in one of those neutral corners where you know you've got parking spaces going both ways. There's no place to. I don't. Yeah. yeah. I see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, that gets us back to I think something that we were I think Meredith would be helpful to go through since we didn't quite I don't know that we nailed everything that design review had suggested. So I'm gonna ask Meredith go through all of their suggested proposals and then. Just want to make sure that nothing in there that you're, you're in agreement with. Right. I didn't repeat all seven or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm going to read through all seven of the actual recommendations um, as well as the two options that were thrown in here. Keep in mind that some of these things don't fall within the 24 VSA 4413 items that were actually you know, supposed to be regulating, but if everybody agrees to them and they're part of the site plan, it's going to be become part of the permit because it's on there. Um, so, and some of these things are things that we've already discussed, but I just want to make sure we are complete here. So recommendations from the design review committee um, on a five to zero vote today was to select the number one option for the large artwork panels. Um, so that would be the one that Greg described with the screen print behind the metal framing. Is that a good way to describe it? Um, and then having a public <coughs> contest for the selection of the actual artwork to be printed on the screens, provided that the artwork on the scrim shall be muted black and gray tones in color and subtle, preferably echoing the neighborhood themes. Recommendation number two, cornices shall be made out of either GFRC or a polymer composite material, but shall be colored to resemble the gray granite used elsewhere on the building. Number three, the decking for the boardwalk shall preferably be made from locally sourced black locust. If that's not practicable, is it IPA? IP? IPA, sorry, or another tropical hardwood to withstand the anticipated heavy use and weathering of the surface. Four, use a smooth, not rough finish for the granite portions of the garage because rougher faces are more apt to catch and hold dirt, increasing maintenance costs. Five, and this is five and seven are going to kind of cover some similar ground, but five, change the landscaping around the access between the proposed hotel and garage to invite access rather than hide the access to the pathway. Um, also, open curbing for walkable access. Six, Clarify that the fencing and railings at the rear of the garage may be galvanized metal or black ink color metal material um, back against the building and galvanized on the boardwalk area. So they really want the railings that are actually part of the building to be black. Stuff on the railings on the boardwalk, the galvanized metal, but anything that's actually on the building black so it sort of sinks in a little bit. And then s recommendation seven, um, clear markings and signage compatible with the wayfinding proposal by the Montpelier Alive to guide pedestrians and bicycles to the bike and walking paths along the river need to be included in the final designs. Then there's two optional items. Bike racks may be provided on the boardwalk as well as inside the parking garage. And option two, applicant may provide hardware for hanging temporary banners over the large artwork sections on the river side of the garage, perhaps eye bolts below the cornice work. That's those, it. Those were all agreeable to us. So the, you're, you're fine with all seven of them? All seven of the recommendations of the, the directions. recommendations. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, at this point, if there's no further comments, we could close the public hearing. In, 
Go ahead. Chief, Meredith. does anybody else have anything that they have to <coughs> One thing that I don't think was addressed. Please. Okay. So, um, I think this might be a question for James because it's about the lighting. The type SL8 lighting that you're going to be putting within the landscaped wells, um, my understanding based on the um, well, one, I didn't see any lumen outputs for those. I did sort of an estimate that it's going to probably be less than a thousand lumens um, per eight watt fixture. So if you could clarify that if possible. I don't know if you can. Um, and then the definition of partially shielded is that the fixtures have to be aimed no, for, no higher than 45 degrees above straight down. But I think your plan was to have them horizontally, like 90 degrees, right? The idea is just to have that area, the ground plane glow yep. as um, just as sort of a highlight lighting to the landscape. There. Okay, and so but you could meet the partially shielded of making absolutely. sure it points 45, no higher than 45 degrees. Right, and it being in a well, we don't think there'll be any light creep okay. six feet deep. Um, and for the, I mean, generally, would you say an eight watt LED is at least, le it's less than a thousand lumens? Shush, I really don't know that. Um, okay, I, I, I so. put in yeah. some charts for the board in my staff, I don't know yeah. comments. Um, I in terms of foot candles, uh, yeah. I mean, we have that on the plan, and so you can see exactly how many foot candles each one puts okay. out. Okay. Oh, okay. Foot. All right. I, you I might mean, have to <laughs> <laughs> like foot candles versus lumens. Old school. It's, yeah. it's old school. I, I think that's how they okay. I mean, we would just use the basically this is low voltage lighting that is just very very minimal just to highlight down there also um, just to create a sort of level of safety at the ground plane just to keep it ba very barely lit you know so there's no light creep but again just some light down there and we can point them down at the 45 to make them cut up it's really whether or not you all are satisfied I'm I I'm okay but I'm not the one making the decision did you have anything else for it? I don't have anything else that I found missing. Board members, members of the public, any further last minute comments, testimony? And I would suggest that uh, I would uh, take a motion to close the public hearing at this point. So moved. Seconded. Is there any further discussion among the board members before we take a vote on closing the public hearing? I guess I was just curious on on um, the pros and cons of, of closing the hearing. Um, if we, I guess, um, if through our deliberations we found that there was more information that came up during the deliberations, pros and cons of of, of closing the hearing. Um, so. If, so if, if you close the hearing and move to go close and move into deliberative session, which you can do, we, if you're in deliberative session and there are questions that come up that you don't have answers to in the material, in the meeting minutes, um, then we would have to reopen the hearing. And you know, so do, you're, we'd have to notice for a new hearing. It would be best if we address that now before yeah. we take the vote. Just make sure everybody feels like yeah, that yeah. that was the whole point of making sure nobody had any more questions. Correct. Right. I guess I was just um, I was just thinking about having a final site plan provided before making a decision on the project. Oh. Rather than going rather than closing the public hearing. In which case that would mean we would not close the public hearing. So you want to continue it to we the next continue. hearing. I guess I was trying to get a sense of the board on, on for, for me, I, I'm thinking, um, I see there are quite a few conditions, and um, I guess I would appreciate some level of discussion on, on how many conditions we were kind of considering attaching to the permit versus waiting to have a more finalized site plan provided, so some of those conditions could be cleared up instead of them okay. attached that, to that, the permit. That opens up a, no, another perspective. So what does the board feel about this? I don't, I mean, I feel like the site plans the applicants have provided are s sufficient to review the project. 
I don't think that I think they've ref said that everything this ref reflects the proposal. Uh, if you're, t I mean, and the the final plat as far as far as the subdivision goes will need to get filed, and we can put conditions on what that final plat has to include on it. As far as I mean, that that's about it. Uh, I think. Because I guess we, were we looking at the site plan, an amended site plan being provided for the hotel um, landscaping change for the tree or for the? I was also just curious about if, if, if we were going to take the recommendation of the design committee and have some changes made, would a final site plan? be submitted that would incorporate those <coughs> changes? So you have two options. You can have that final, th those final site plans resubmitted to this board for your approval at another, at a continued hearing. Alternatively, the conditions on the decisions that you issue can say that all of those final approved site plans and or um, subdivision plats for each of these three different permits can come to basically my office, to the Department of Planning, and to the zoning administrator. And if the zoning administrator feels that they don't correspond with the conditions on the permits, then I don't accept them and they don't get their permits until they actually meet up. If there has been a change in the plans that they've made, then we have to, that, that has to happen, that is a material change where it would change, it would potentially change this decision, it would come back to the board. Because as a zoning administrator, the zoning administrator can't accept that. It so basically reopens the whole permit. They well, either have to meet the conditions or they don't. So, I mean, you have two options. Well, you we, can we go have back more, here we for you. Yeah, but. Uh, we, it's off yet. We have three <coughs> and we can take them individually or we can take them together. Mm -hmm. That's true. So, if we, if we wanted to address them one at a time, we can do that. Uh, yes. It, okay. And I, Claire, I appreciate um, your question. And it seems to me that, that um, with Meredith's assistance, because she's been taking really good notes on the various sort of agreements and tweaks, um, the question is whether or not we're comfortable uh, closing the, the hearing now, but having that running list of requirements um, as we deliberate, and, and, uh, and then that would be reflected in the final uh, site plan. And that gives us the ability to also tweak it as we see fit. You know, in our conversation, we may, we may uh, you know, we may uh, have other, I, you know, other thoughts that come out of the discussion. So, um, so I think we can meet your concerns, but also, you know, close the, the hearing. I'm comfortable with that anyway. Um, so let me go back to the, the motion that's on the table at the moment, which is to close the public hearing, not to move into the deliberative session, but to close the public hearing. And we didn't specify. Is that for all or is that for one? So... Um, I'd suggest we, we, I mean, they're all interrelated. Um, I suggest we just treat them, uh, that we close the public hearing for all three. And move into deliberative session? Yes. Okay, so I would accept an amended motion. Would that be a Deb? I, I'll second that. My, friend, my friendly amendment? Yep, that's good. Okay, Tom, do you second with the friendly amendments? Second. Okay, so now we have a revised uh, motion is there, the advised motion is to close the public hearing for all three applications and for the board to move into deliberative session. Is there any further discussion? Seeing that there is none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. And uh, all members present have uh, four and six. Zero. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, we are now going to. Uh, Move into. Uh, oh, do, do we oh. want to finish the agenda? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's getting a little later. Uh -huh. okay. uh,
got to find my agenda. Exactly. <laughs> this is DRC agenda. Yes, my cops, please. Oh, well, you can you, 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 you got it. You do yours. I just I don't need think I need one. Oh, I've got mine. Oh. I've got my notes. And if, if people want to chat loudly, maybe move out so that we can also hear each other to finish the rest of the hearing. Or the meeting. Sorry. Okay. I have no further uh, business. Does uh, you know that you have anything? Uh, point of, I think our next meeting announcement. Yep. Our next meeting announcement is November 19th, uh, 2018. Same time for I don't think I have anything else. <laughs> no, I have nothing to add. Okay, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> okay, uh, all those in favor of adjourning, please raise your right hand. We are now adjourned.